Okay, let's go ahead and flip ourselves over to the other side of the equation, which is really actually doing some building modeling and talking about building modeling and seeing it in action. So here is the skew. Um, just wanting to do some sliding down to kind of really put it in context, hopefully. Because as we think about building modeling and really why it is so revolutionary and why it's changing the industry so radically, it's kind of helpful to sort of understand just the historical evolution to how we got here and really what problem it's trying to solve. So here's where it all really started. Way back when in the beginning, as we needed to go through and design things and ultimately communicate things with people who were going to build them. So I have this fantastic vision up here. I need to somehow communicate it to you and other people who are going to build it for us. Yeah, we had this need to go ahead and basically communicate the model and ultimately document what's in my head and kind of share it with other people. So way back when, where we got started with all this was, you know, back in the days of master builders, we created physical models. So you created something like this as the documentation as well as the way of communicating how this thing was going to be built. And that actually kind of worked out okay when the pharaoh or his master builder was communicating about the pyramids. We had this fantastic model. You probably have one of them. And what would happen is, oh, as you were working with that model, if there was anyone who needed to sort of study and understand the model, you know, you pretty much not with our Stanley tape, but you'd go up and measure and figure out exactly what it is. But we've been doing scale models for an awful long time. The cool thing about scale models is they actually resolve themselves in 3D. So the process of actually building a model and having to actually think about how those columns and those beams and all those connections are going to work, you know, and having to do it even at a micro scale is very, very useful because you couldn't really hide a whole lot. It really did have to resolve here, okay? And there was some sort of a beauty to that. The problem with working with these scale models and trying to do it that way is that I can't really communicate it very easily either to a lot of people or remotely. Pretty much you have to come see the model, kind of check it out, try to scale things off it. You know, there's sort of a limitation. So it's good from a design standpoint in terms of having to really understand what it is you're going to build. Okay, but not so good from a communication standpoint. Okay, so yeah, that was ultimately the limitation behind doing it this way. But it was a fantastic way to do it. It really did work pretty well, you know, for quite a while. The problem was it didn't scale nicely in terms of being able to move up. So we got to the whole notion of actually starting to do architectural drawings. And this is a whole discipline that really came out of the Renaissance era. And this whole notion of how we can take a 3D vision and ultimately reduce it to a series of different 2D visions that would sort of explain how the whole thing gets together is actually you know, kind of tough. There's really a level of abstraction that's required. And if we're in the AAC industry, we learn to be pretty good at it. You know, we're learning because we've been trained to do it, to sort of draw a floor plan looking from the top. And you know, pretty much the floor plan is pretty, you know, it's, it's like you're just looking at it that way. It's kind of straight on down. We got to that whole idea of the elevation, it's kind of a front elevation or a side elevation. We came up with a whole series of different ways of doing these 2D drawings out of it. And it kind of works out pretty well in terms of doing it, but it's not necessarily easy for people to understand. Uh, if you've ever had the experience of looking at a set of construction docs or drawings with people, you find they're actually kind of confusing. It's actually pretty hard to work with clients. When I have projects that I'm working on, I'm working with clients, they're looking at the floor plan and everyone kind of pretends they understand what's going on. You don't want to feel, you know, uninformed. You want to, you know, but really, do you understand what's going on there? A lot of people have a hard time resolving these 2D abstractions into kind of a real understanding of what it's going to be like to walk through the space and understand the space. So we came up with this whole system of plans, elevations, and sections, as well as 3D views. You know, isometric, axonometric perspectives, there's a whole kind of language and hierarchy to this. And if you take CE31Q, the basic drawing class, you'll actually learn how to produce a lot of these things kind of manually and really the fundamental principle behind them. But what we're going to do in this class is a little bit different. We're going to ultimately, you know, continue to model on the computer, but ultimately be able to produce these kind of drawings, okay, as a way of communicating and reducing it back to 2D. So the design tool, you know, when we're doing these architectural drawings, it's, you know, the drawings are serving as a design tool, the plan of record, it's for communicating between all these different groups, 
And ultimately, it kind of gets to be pretty hard. Okay, so how about this? Let's try a little experiment. I need a volunteer. Any old volunteer. And I think I pick on everyone at some point through the class. So uh, how about, we have one right here. Hey, could you please step out of the room for just a moment? We'll come and get you in a minute. It'll only be about three or four. I need another volunteer. Somebody? Oh, 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 okay. Actually, now I'm going to open you. Come on, friend. Just because we're going to spread it around here. Okay, here's the deal. This is my fantastic design vision. Okay, you see it? Okay, you have, oh, we have some markers over here. Please go ahead and communicate this design vision. You can draw whatever you want to up on the board here in a special way that he's going to be able to build it for us. Okay, and I'll give you about two minutes to do it. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> what, yeah. Okay, so I'm guessing you do give me like a floor plan view. Just it's probably one of the toughest things I'll ask you to do all quarter. <laughs> like... Okay, very good. That's enough. Any, any other views you want to give Elevation. That's actually like a 3D view, actually. Yeah, it's really cool. I know, 3D view is actually pretty hard to do. It is really hard. Then we're done. Beautiful. Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, I apologize. Hey, you know, first part of the demonstration. It's actually kind of hard to get from that to this and think about all the different views. It would be helpful if I gave you some more time and an accurate model, but like that would be going, okay, let's call him back in. Hey, he's going to join us. <laughs> <laughs> Construction. So uh, please go ahead and yeah, a couple minutes. Try to make some sense of that. Um, See what you can which do. Which viewpoint is this? That's the plan. That's the like plan. Like looking down. Oh, the floor, <laughs> floor plan. Floor okay. Plan. Yes, Thank you. Okay. With a roof. So this is looking <laughs> yeah. down on it. Yeah. It's a weird triangle thing happening. Is that's the roof? Oh, this is the roof. So I'm looking down like yeah. this. So roof down, and this is the. Roof. That's just out front. Okay, I'm with you. Yeah. This is actually pretty good in that, you know, often the instructor doesn't get to talk to the designer and have the uh, yeah. feedback, so it's okay. a little enhanced. So, little yeah, so, so the roof and this the That's that in 3D. Okay. So the roof is the, so the roof is here. trapezoidal thing on top. This right here, I'm taking it as this. Yeah. Okay, better get building. Come on, time is ticking. Boss is going to be on your case here. Hey, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I can use this as the roof. That's what you Are these pillars or windows? Those are pillars. Okay, right? yeah. Like, see the dots? Those okay. are the columns. Uh, okay. This is known as a request for information. The <laughs> <laughs> one is quite clear. We have to go back to the designer for a little clarification.
Oh, oh! I'm supposed to use all of these. Well, there's no hope of that. So. I, did yeah. <laughs> I did not purchase this device. <laughs> uh, it was more against sexual design. This really wasn't uh, kind of accurate that way. Okay. I have no idea Is this supposed to be what kind of building is this? Maybe a temple with a garden out front. I don't know. <laughs> It's actually a house. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm thinking like logical pines, like up in the Northwest Native American style of like a meeting house. You know what those look like? Okay. <laughs> this is actually kind of interesting. Like a community meeting house. In the... yeah. it, it's, it's, it's like playing telephone. It's amazing how much information gets lost away. <laughs> <laughs> but the rest of you might write, yeah, that's actually sort of a model of the Roby house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, like a prairie house in North Chicago. Ducks. And really, you have to make all sorts of different views. You can have a plan view, maybe cut through the house that would show uh, these columns, so you get a pretty good sense of that. We want a roof plan view, cut a little higher so you can see all those things mass. I probably want a couple different elevation views. But even by the time I put all those different views together, you still have to, in your brain, and it's quite a trick, resolve them all back into 3D. And some people are really good at that, and other people are really challenged by that. So it's really no wonder that when we give people a big set of construction documents, they often sort of struggle with it to kind of put it all together. So just to give you a sense of really how complicated these things get, let me show you. Oh, this is actually right there. This is a set of construction docs, actually, from a house that we did several years ago, just so you get a sense of like how many sheets and what's all involved in here. So I haven't even gone to counting the number of sheets. There's probably like 20 some odd sheets there, and everybody's gone. Site plan views, Title 24 documentation, floor plan views showing the demolition. It was an existing house, and they're adding on to it. So the architectural floor plans, the roof plan at the top, these are all kind of cut from the top looking down. Elevations from the different sides, going in all the different directions, and all the things that we have to document schedules, sections cut through the house. Because if it's very complicated construction, often it's hard to figure out the vertical relationship. So we slice through and show the relationship between the different floor plates and the roofs. How that's all going to come together. Structural sections showing all the little details about the structural pieces that all come together. Okay, more and more of those. Structural details or plans showing all the foundation, the framing. This is like a house. This is not even a large house. This is in like San Jose. But we put all this information together, the structural details, ultimately the electrical plans, the mechanical plans. There's a lot of information here. Let's talk about the challenge here. Okay. The problem is, or one of the problems is, if things were strictly linear and I drew it once and things never changed, if you were really, really good and had time on your hands, you might be able to, in your mind, construct and relate all these things together. As a, as a contractor putting it together, it's actually really hard to sort of necessarily find all the information that's necessary to pull it all together. Because you're looking at this plan and you think you have everything and just call out the different details, but as a designer, I've put all the information in the plans, but really as someone who's consuming it, it's actually pretty hard for you to figure out that all the different details are in there. It's a lot of work. You, know, you may only have partial information when you're actually trying to get things built. Another problem with this whole scenario is that as anything changes, and it's not like construction projects ever change, you know, but they do. Everyone does. It never goes quite the way you find it. There's always some sort of condition that's changing, and we need to revise things. Yeah. 
any time a change is made, you know, that change may ultimately reflect you know, 15 different views out here. So it might affect the plans, it might affect the elevations, it might affect a lot of different drawings. So if I go moving those windows, this whole notion of really which floor plans are affected, which elevations are affected, does it show up in the schedules, is it showing up any of the details? Trying to keep all that coordinated is really sort of a big hassle if I'm really working with the world as a series of different paper documents. So drawing it all on paper is really very, very hard. Okay, and that's really where the world was and really motivated a lot of where we wanted to kind of change um, with going through the building modeling. So just drawing everything on paper the way we used to do it. So you have people who are really good with line weights and ink and they were very good at that. You know, around the early 80s, basically the whole notion of computer-aided drafting came in. And what that was all about was really this notion of could we just sort of improve on the process? Could we use this whole microcomputer capability where at least we can copy and paste things around to say that I shouldn't have to draw that door 15 different times, I should draw it once, and then I can copy and paste it around and have every instance of it kind of have the same uh, representation of it. So computer-aided drafting, it was really all about just we needed to draw more and more and more paper and putting it on the computer with the ability to copy and paste it just gave us a very efficient way of doing it. Okay, so we just didn't have to kind of keep on drawing it all by hand. So that was actually sort of a huge advantage, but it was really all based on efficiency. It was all about repeatability and just speeding up that process. And that got us very far, but we finally kind of came to this notion, or what the fundamental weakness was, is that the lines, all those lines I put on the paper, they don't fundamentally carry any information. They don't really know what they are. From their perspective, they're just a line. So if I change anything, the lines aren't smart enough to update themselves. Okay, if I click on the line, I don't necessarily understand what the meaning of it is. Lines are just lines. They're, they're relatively dumb in this game. There's no coordination. So the whole notion came up based on some brilliant people's idea that, hey, what if instead of thinking about this as a drawing problem, what if we thought this is about this as a modeling problem where we could build 3D models of things and instead of drawing all the lines, we could just put cameras in the model that cut through the model in different ways that let us then kind of see 2D representations of a 3D object. Okay, let the computer do all the hard work of generating that for us. And that's really the origin of the building model. And that's where we came from. Okay, and that's where we're going to. So in terms of the difficulty with working with 2D drawings, I love these because these are actually real, believe it or not. Um, this is like my section on it looks good in the 2D drawings. <laughs> and the funny thing is, if it looks good in the 2D drawings, uh, people will try to build it for you. Okay, so you get weird things like this. Okay, where that looked great in a floor plan view, but no one ever stopped to do a section through it and really understand how big that slope was. Another one that's one of my favorites. <laughs> like, uh, stairways are actually very hard to draw and model properly. So, uh, yeah, stairways always need a little bit of special attention. That's what this one's all about. I kind of like this one. Um, yeah, ultimately, we know that that track is uh, unconditioned or something like that. But there's this whole problem where often the person doing the site and the plot drawings is very different from the person doing the architectural drawings, and those things have to get in coordination with each other. Okay. Again, <laughs> stairs are a real problem. In this case, the, uh, the escalator and the ceiling probably aren't doing too well relative to each other. They have to be very short. <laughs> this one, uh, this actually got built. Yeah, this is one that's actually sort of hard to understand that you could really get this far in the process and no one stopped to think that maybe that ATM had a problem. <laughs> but it's like, you know, it's, it did. Okay, again, it's a, it's. What this often is, I should uh, I just laugh at them. This is an example of a coordination problem between different drawings. But whoever did the site plan probably did a wonderful job, independent of whatever the architect was planning, and never there was never a discussion where they actually realized that we needed some sort of a uh, way of getting up to an ATM, because the site to that I probably never understood there was going to be an ATM there. <laughs> a little cozy. <laughs> Uh, that's probably not going to work too well. Maybe it will. I don't know. Okay, this is another classic <laughs> one. 
Yeah, again, core ignition problem. Whoever's doing the design of the LCD panels versus security system, probably two completely independent contractors. They both started with the same basis, did the work independently, and it just never got together until the field. And now we have an extensive change order to go ahead and fix that and like to make that work. Okay, so building information modeling, it's really all about trying to get some coordination in these teams where really ultimately teams are drowning in information. There's, you look at a modern building project and there's like, like phone books, thousands of sheets of documents that all have to come together. And looking at it as a bunch of paper it's really, really hard to resolve at all, or if we look at things in terms of models, we actually have a chance of looking at the inconsistencies, somehow staying current, yeah, and like that, being able to coordinate with each other. Okay, let's go ahead and let's shift our focus here. Actually, I'm gonna shift over to actually a real building model so you can see what I mean when we actually put it in place. And to do that, what I'm gonna do is actually shift over to the PC side of things, and here we'll go ahead and take a look at, we'll open up Revit, and we'll open up a sample project just to give you a sense of really what building models are like and what we're going to be doing with them. So over in the PC world right now, I will just open up the Revit application. After you install Revit on your machine, there's actually a great little sample project. That's a good one to just sort of play around with and get a sense of what's going on. So let's let it open up. There we go. I'm going to expand that window to make it as big as I can. And the project I'm going to open up is called Sample Architectural Project. So if you have Revit on your machine, go ahead and you can follow along. If not, just do this at home after you get things installed or in the lab and you get a chance to play with this. So this is an example of a little house. It's a little like a house that's really designed to illustrate some sustainability features. We're looking at really a sheet view of it right now. So there's a Table, there's kind of an image, some of images over here, they're kind of all in a title sheet. There's really a whole different series of sheets in this that illustrate different pieces. So there's a site plan sheet which contains a lot of different views of the model. In this case, it's containing kind of a shaded plot plan view and a little solar helion view. You can sort of see that. There's some floor plan views. Okay, these look like kind of conventional floor plans. There's some elevation views. Again, kind of looking at it from different perspectives, even some sections. Okay. So at this level, you're looking at it, it may all look very different from just a drafted set of sheets that are containing all these different views. The important thing, though, is how these things got generated, because these didn't get generated by a lot of drafting. These got generated by actually creating a 3D model and then just cutting different sections to the model. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to go ahead and just close all these views. And I'm going to open up the 3D view, the default 3D view. So this is actually the 3D model. And if I go zoom in on in there a little bit, you'll see that is the model. In terms of the environment, in the Revit environment, there's a couple of other big things to note. Over here, there's a list of different views. You can think of those as all those different cameras within the model that are going to generate those 2D views. Over here on this side, there's something called the properties palette. And the properties palette shows us for any individual element the properties of the specific selected element. So for example, I can do things like, oh, select that roof object and tell a little about it. I know that it's basically some sort of metal panel roof. Okay, I know a little about sort of uh, the slope, the thickness, and the things about it. But that object is basically an active object now, so I can go through and start changing things or querying that object. Let's go ahead and do this. What I'll do is I'll open up the uh, floor plan view at the upper level. You might sort of recognize this as being very similar. Let me go through and tile these together. And we'll just kind of put them two side by side so you get a sense of where I'm going. So I'm going to shut that floor that view. I'll tile these. Okay, so here's what I want to show you. The cool thing about building models is when we construct 3D models, everything is fully interlinked and there really is no static view. Everything is ultimately kind of connected to each other. So for example, in this model, if I go through and select an object over here, you'll see it's highlighted over on that side in the plan view. For example, I'll go ahead and try and get that bathroom window. As I've selected the bathroom window over here, 
Notice that it's also kind of highlighted over here, because I've actually selected the object. All these different views are just different 3D perspectives on it. We're just rendering it in different ways. A floor plan view is really, it's just 3D space, but we have a camera that's cutting through space at four foot six above the ground looking down. Okay? We have a ceiling plan view, it's the same, but looking up at the ceiling. Elevation views are just vertical, as opposed to being cut through horizontally, but they're also related. For example, I'll do the same, let me get to, oh, what is it, the south elevation? Try that. There we go. And I'll tie all this in also so you can see it also. So basically the same thing is happening here. I have that window selected in three different views. In fact, I have that window selected in the fourth view over here. Here's the kind of numerical description of the window. Okay, so it's here in all the different places. The nice thing about really working with objects as opposed to working with lines, and we're going to be looking at building elements or objects to work with, is that you can change them really easily. So for example, I've got that one window selected. If I want to go through and choose, hmm, don't have very much windows in terms of like changes there. We go ahead and change the dimensions. Maybe that'll be a little easier. Frame, casement depth. What's the measurement? This is actually doing it in millimeters, okay. which actually, which to me is actually kind of really hard. Let me switch that over because uh, I'll get myself in trouble if I keep on trying to do it this way. I'll go to project units and switch that over so instead it's feet and inches. But what I will advise is for everyone work in the unit system which is comfortable to them because you have an innate kind of intuition about the unit system. So if you like feet and inches, go ahead and switch it over. So here I am, I've got that window over there, it's my standard window, you'll see it's currently about eight feet tall, about five feet wide. If I decide that, hey, for that window, I'd like to make it like two feet wide instead. That's interesting, it's doing a little installation. Let's see what it's doing here. These are manufacturers pretty good about um, having their products as graphic models you can import right in. Yes, actually that's something that's become really huge now is that for manufacturers, you know, putting, uh, creating library parts which represent all the things that are in your catalog is huge. You know, it makes it much, much easier to specify your products if the library parts there. So there's really a whole team that just works specifically on trying to literally uh, create libraries of those parts. So it's kind of like taking the place of the suites catalog. It used to be you went to like libraries and this stuff and looked them up in books, but nowadays you go to online libraries and pull down parts that are accurately represented. I'm not sure it's going on with a little reconfiguration going on here, but let's see if I uh, should let it just keep going for a second. It's doing something, and I don't want to wait for it. So I'm going to cancel that. We'll do something else. So if I actually end up bombing it somehow. Not a good first demo, but we'll figure this out. I'm not sure what Revit is doing right now. Okay, so now, oh, there it is. I'm going to change it. Okay. What Revit's doing in the background? I'm not quite sure. We'll figure it out. So you see that window change there to two feet. It not only changed here in the elevation view, it changed over here in the plan view, it also changed kind of in the 3D view there. So the nice thing about building models is really you can make a change anywhere in the building model and it ultimately affects everything because there really isn't the notion of a static view. Everything is ultimately uh, just related. So come on down here. Does it perform crash detection while you, like when you change it or do you have to ask it to It'll notice that things are interfering while you're changing it if like a window conflicts with a joined wall or something like that. Um, a higher level, like checking to see does a mechanical element hit a structural element, that we have to actually tell it to do. So I'll warn you about this. The building model is what? It's, it's only, what did I say? It'll let you do things that are wrong. Okay, it won't stop you from doing them. You get, uh, have it look for things that are a little bit wrong and have you warn you about those things, but it'll let you do things that are a little bit off in terms of what's doing that because it wants to, it doesn't want to constrain you, it wants to give you the design flexibility, so checking tends to be a post-process. Okay, 
But when it notices something that's distinctly wrong, it will go through and tell you. Okay, I'm gonna do something like, I'll take out that window right here. For example, another thing I can do is, besides just kind of choosing it, I can just leave it. I'm trying to delete it. It's actually giving me troubles right now. Of course it is, because we're trying to demonstrate it to you guys. But let's see what's going on here. Let me pop that up. I'm going to figure out why that's not doing it. There's something weird going on right now. It's something about my, build, my model being locked up in some funny way. Probably has something to do with this thing going on right down here. Is that? Okay. It is still there, actually. The wall has gone transparent on me. But see, it's not letting me do that. Let me go ahead and try cutting it out of this and open it up again. I was playing around last night with doing some installation stuff, so I think I got myself in trouble. And that part down there is the part that bothers me. So let's go ahead and see if we can actually get this uh, patched up. Give me just a second. Let me go back to Task Manager. See if I can kill it off for a second. Yes, I really do want to get rid of you. Okay, try again. I'll work out my issues in terms of what's going on with like uh, changing that up. It was working fine yesterday, we always say. We're kind of here. The important thing though is that really as we go through and make any changes anywhere, yeah, you know, it inherently stays coordinated because there really isn't the notion of two separate things. Everything's just really a view that's rendering it into a floor plan or an elevation view. So any change we make to the model should ultimately kind of be holistic. about the models and all these different elements and the ability to change them is we can look at them in a number of different ways. So we can look at them in terms of floor plan, elevation views, um, look at them in terms of individual things. We can also go through and look at them in terms of different schedules. So really all this information, actually not too much in terms of the schedules right there right now, is ultimately available as tables. So for example, if we wanted to get a table listing the areas of all the different walls, table listing, uh, the windows that need to be ordered, all those sorts of things, you know, we can produce numerical schedules that ultimately are really useful for doing uh, construction estimating or quantity ordering. It's really all driven by ultimately what's in the model. So for example, if I under view, went through and said, let me go through and kind of create a new schedule. Oh, if for example, I decided that I want to schedule all the windows, I could do that. Specify really what I want to see in there. I want to put the family in there. I want to put the height and the width of the windows in there. Okay, find height and width. There is height. Find width in there. I can really quickly create a window schedule that's listing all those things. I can start to apply formulas to this, for example. Like uh, multiplying those things together to figure out what the area of the windows are, which is something we might need to document for lead compliance, or just figure out how much glass is in here. It's all just numerically linked data. That's the important thing. It's a big database of information. And that's really even where the name BIM comes from, what you need to understand about that. It's building information modeling. Okay, so you know, we do the building modeling, we spend a lot of time modeling the adapter, that's where we focus our attention, but the key is that ultimately the information gets to be contained in the model. And this model ultimately becomes the best source of unified information for everything going on in the project for the architects, the engineers, the constructors all to work on and understand and coordinate their information. So you know, the important thing about BIM is the eye. It's the information that ultimately goes back in there and how we can interact with it. So there's all these ways in terms of being able to create these views. The idea is we really aren't going to go through and kind of draw any of these things. We're just going to create different elevations, which are different cameras, things like that. But let me show you how easy it is ultimately to kind of create these views even. So for example, I'm looking at this 3D model. Yeah, it's going to look good, okay. If I wanted to cut a section through that model, for example, 
how I can do that looks like this. Now, if you've been doing architectural drafting, cutting sections and stuff like that can be cumbersome in terms of doing that and trying to keep them all resolved. How we do it in a 3D modeling world is we just choose the section tool and ultimately just draw a section line right through the project. Okay, with that section line, this is now a live 3D view of that model. We can shade it and kind of make it look better if we want to. And you clicked on that arrow, the blue arrows, to determine which way it's looking. Yeah, so even over here, by default it put it down this way, but again, it's just an object, it's a camera. Currently it's focusing this way. You can see really what the range is, how far out it is. If I want to go through and change that, there's this little glyph right here which lets you flip it. Now I'm looking at the section in the other direction. And that's really what we're going to get into doing. Everything's going to be model it accurately once, and then after that, just set up the different views, whether it's 3D views, perspective views, whatever it is you want of it, and then just create those, you know, make those views, render it the way you want it, but the information only has to be modeled once, and the cool thing is, once the view's set up, no matter what happens to the model, the view will always show the current model. Okay, so that's really what saves you all the time, there's no redrafting. Yeah. Um, this may be like kind of ahead of the game, so you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but I see it says like solar analysis up there. Um, when you're doing that kind of analysis, do you have to put in like contextual information, like geographic information, stuff like that? Yep. So for all the different models, ultimately we give them a location, and that will tell the latitude and the longitude, which tells a lot about the sun, as well as the weather profile, how much rain, what the temperature profile is. That's all going to come into the energy analysis. Okay. So we yeah. manually input the, that? No, what you do is we just basically, you know, we, we choose this location on Google Maps. And it just does. Yeah, and then it goes off to a server and pulls all that information in there for you. Okay. So very, very powerful. When we get to building performance analysis, we're going to play around with that in terms of the heliodon and really understanding how much solar radiation is hitting each of those different surfaces. Okay, so I can create these 2D views very easily. That's kind of cool. Yeah, you might actually want to go through and create 3D views too. So let's talk about that. There's this view that I keep on playing around with, the default 3D view, it looks pretty good. But if I want to go through and customize that a little bit so that it actually, uh, for example, looks like one of those sections that we've been doing. We can take any of the 2D views and actually make the 3D version of it. So here's how we do that. If, for example, I want to take that 2D view, I can right click on this 3D view and say, I really like to match a section. So let me just match that section we just cut. What it'll do is it'll sort of flatten it out. What it's done is actually rotated the camera around in space, but cut things. And now we have basically the section cut through the model that we can then start to use to actually understand the construction details that we want to. Now, in this view, it's a little hard to sort of see what's going on. Let me see if I can kind of, oh, make that section box visible so you can see it. Here's a box, like a big box which is cutting planes all around the house. If I push and pull it in, or if I push and pull it down, I can really quickly start subdividing and slicing the model up however I want to. So that's pretty cool. So you can very quickly take that model and start creating any views you want to. Another thing you can do that a lot of people like is, well, especially from an architectural standpoint, we can go through and if you want to create a perspective view, and if you've done architectural drawing, you know how hard this can be in terms of creating perspective views. We can place cameras in the model. So I'm just going to place a camera out here uh, in the garden, kind of facing back towards the model. Okay, and there is the 3D view. Okay, now it's a 3D view. It looks kind of cool as a pseudo photograph, and that's kind of nice. But the cool thing is, it's still active. So that window is still active. If I change that window, if I change the elements of the curtain wall, anything if I change in here, Take out that rail and whatever it is, yeah. it's going to basically be changing it in the 3D model at the same time as it goes through, or changing in all the floor plan views and the elevation views at the same time. So we can do this in terms of creating, let me just kind of look around here a little bit, exterior elevations and looking at the house that way. We can also do that. We have some 3D views in here of different interior rooms. 
and again, sort of a rendered view of it. I'm just going to shade it down. So let me roll on back all the way out to really what we're going to do relative to this yeah, and how the course fits together. Ultimately, you're going to learn how to do all these things and get all these sorts of views out of the model. And you're going to find that it's going to be very useful for you if you're an architectural student and you want to illustrate your architectural concepts. It's going to be very useful if you're looking at it from an analytical side, trying to use it for structural analysis or building performance analysis or construction planning and sequency. But it all starts with building an accurate model. So that's what really the first part of the class is. These first six classes, seven classes, we're really going to learn how to model all the different types of elements and their nuance so that we really get very good, solid models that give you the flexibility to model what you need. Okay. Then we're going to move into the whole notion of these views and how we set the cameras and shade them or filter things in and out or control how they're represented and render. That's the second little chunk. And then for the third piece, we take that same well-constructed model and hopefully we learn how we take it through different analysis. Performance analysis, structural analysis, construction sequencing. Okay, so that's kind of the high-level overview. So by the end of all this, you're going to be so, so fluid with this. You know, you'll just, like it's yesterday, you'll just no problem at all in terms of getting this stuff done. But that's kind of just sort of tease where we're going. Okay, so if you can, between now and then, um, we'll wrap up for today, but if between now and Thursday, if you are going to install it on one of your machines, please give it a try. Just sort of see how it goes, and we'll sort of try to triage some of the questions on Thursday. For the really weird ones, we may sort of defer that to a special meeting with some people to solve some of those, but let's see if we can get the software installed as a good foundation. And if you do, bring your computer to class so you can play along. And then we'll start just basically working with basic building models. So Thursday, what we're going to do is uh, just take you through the exercise of building a very basic structure. It may look like a doghouse, but it's going to have walls, doors, windows, and a roof on it by the time you get out of here. Okay? Okay, beautiful. Let's go ahead and break for today. Thank you.